My honourable brothers and my honourable sisters, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us to come close to him and we all make this effort and an attempt. <clears throat> However, Shaitan, he also has a mission. He also has a mission and that mission of Shaitan is to detect us, take us away from our purpose of life. What is the purpose of life? Is the purpose of life that we eat, we sleep, we die, we have family, we have children, we do business? Or is the purpose of life, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we do good deeds and we invest for the hereafter of the akhirah? The Quran tells us, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, that, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ but I have not created man or jinn except that they worship me. This is the ultimate purpose of our creation. And we make this effort, mashallah, we all make an effort. We wake up in the morning, we pray our fajr, dhuhr, asr, maghrib, isha. In these short days, it's even more challenging. However, Muslims being people of principle, people of discipline, we adhere to the commandments of Allah Jalla wa ala. And Shaitan is not happy about this. Shaitan can never sit still until he does not fulfill his promise that he made to Allah. Open the Quran in Surah Al Baqarah, open the Quran in many of the ayah verses of the Quran, you will find Shaitan made a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His first problem, his first problem, and I want you to that the brothers and sisters to think about this deeply. We many a times think that robbing people, deceiving people is major sin. Of course it's a major sin. But is sin only that which people and the community and the popular culture and the society around us think to be sin? I ask you this question. Take for example, stealing. In, in the culture that we live in, regardless of religion, regardless of background, if somebody is caught stealing, everybody looks down upon that person. That this is a bad thing that this person has done. This is wrong that this person has done. But my question to you is, is ism, is sin, going against Allah, only that thing that everybody else accepts, society accepts. On the other hand, take for example, riba, interest. Everybody is doubling in interest. Bank accounts, credit cards, mortgages, car finance, so many things you know better than I do. You can't just get away from it. We are drowned in our surroundings of interest. And as for those who are conscious, they can stay away from it. However, in society, it's accepted. Everybody accepts. What's the problem? What is the problem? Does that mean that taking a riba and an interest is not a sin? Of course it's a sin. Rather, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is not a single point in the Quran and there is not a single other point that you will find in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares war except for that individual who takes interest. But the point is, just because everybody else accepts interest, does that justify interest? Of course not. Similarly, there are many, many things that we will want to do as Muslims. There are many, many things that we will try to adhere to. And amongst all of this, we will find shaitan sitting in the middle. He made a promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, when Allah took him out, and why did Allah take him out? Allah didn't take him out for that major sin of killing somebody, of committing zina, of lying. No, the greatest sin, the first sin that took place is hasan. Enmity, hatred, somebody else has something, why don't I have it? Why does he have to have it? May he go to Jahannam, I want this. This hatred, this burning sensation of hatred was the first sin and the greatest sin as which calamity will reach people to Qiyamah. And what is this calamity? The calamity of the affliction of Shaitan. We never think this to be a problem. They say in English, stick and stones may break your bones, words don't hurt me. 
Stick and stones may break your bones. Words don't hurt me. This is a false economy in the Islamic principle. But what your tongue says, what your tongue does, how you act and how you think and how you feel, all of this is constructed in the teachings of Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What was the problem with shaitan? He said, خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارُ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينِ But then Allah, you created me from fire. I'm the stronger, I'm more powerful, I have more honor. You created him from dust, he's from nothing. So Allah says, get out of here. Allah threw him out. The Quran is categorical, brothers and sisters. There's no wishy-washy stuff. The Quran is categorical. Allah said, get out. What did Allah say get out for? Because he felt that he was better than somebody else. And when Allah took him out, this pride of shaitan did not finish. He said, Allah, I will come in front of them. I will go from behind them. I will attack them from the right. I will attack them from the left. I will remain in their path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him this to be the case. And he took, a, he asked Allah, that, Oh Allah, give me this privilege. So Allah said, you have this privilege. Except for those of my servants. Except for those of my servants who make that effort. Who try to stay on Sirat al Mustaqim. Who make this effort. For those, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make peace. What we learn from this is that shaitan will be in your, in your way of life. And he will do everything he can. He will do everything he can until he takes you off track. And amongst those taking people off track is that we feel sometimes this mentality like shaitan that we feel, Alhamdulillah, I pray my salah. Look at this person, he doesn't pay their salah. Alhamdulillah, I pray the Quran. Look at this person, they don't pay the Quran. Looking down upon people. Looking down upon people is one of the greatest sins a man can do. One of the greatest sins a man can do. When you think that I am better than somebody else, remember that you are the worst of the worst. The moment shaitan comes into your heart and makes you feel that, Alhamdulillah, I am better than somebody else, think to yourself, I am the worst of the people. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, like that of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an and others. Including Aisha radiallahu anha, the beloved wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had so much attachment to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they would never undermine somebody else. Never look down upon somebody else. The moment you think that you are better than somebody else, you are the worst of the worst. And this is a trick of shaitan. This is a trick of shaitan. He will do you his utmost best that to make you feel better than somebody else. And then when this happens, we have this problem in society, brothers and sisters, that we start to expose people's sins. And this is my topic for today. We start to expose people's sin. Somebody does something wrong, we are the first one to go and tell somebody else, oh, have you seen what this person is doing? We think our spirituality overcomes so much that we are ready to talk about somebody else. Oh, have you seen this Fula sister is hanging out with this Fula brother? There might be nothing there. There might be blood kin. But we start to become judgmental. Let's even assume this person is doing something wrong. He does not give us the right in any way or form to look down upon this person. Our role is what? Is to enjoy the good and forbid the evil. Our role is to tell somebody that what you are doing is wrong, is to address them, but never look down upon them. Never look down upon them. Hence, we learn in the traditions that when a person commits a sin, when a person does categorical sin, then our role is to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. We don't look down upon Abdullah who is committing zina. We don't look down upon that individual. Who knows? Who knows that before we die, the tables can turn. Who knows that the table can turn. Today I look down upon them. Tomorrow, before they die, they become the best of people. They become like me, who is praying, who is giving zakah, who is conscious. And I become like them, who don't really care, who are doing everything wrong in the book. And I die upon that state. <coughs> Hence, we never look down upon an individual. We look down upon the sin. We look down upon the actual sin. That is un unacceptable in our deen, in our religion. Regardless of what that sin may be. It might be the most kabair, the greatest of the sins of the sins. And I don't need to spell these out for you, brothers and sisters. You know better than I do. Even sins 
which in popular culture has become accepted, which even in popular culture has become accepted, even if Muslims shout the slogan that I openly commit this sin, it does not mean that this sin is accepted in Islam. The Quran is categorical. We have Sarahatul Nas, black and white, clear cut ayat of the Quran that tell us if things, when things are haram. We have the ayat and we have the ahkam and we have the ahadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's leave aside those ahadith which are categorized as weak or as questionable. Though, that in itself, there are hardly any ahadith which are questionable. Though Allah have mercy upon the ulama kiram. The ulama have categorized those ahadith which are hadith al -hunkar which are not accepted. I'm just referring to ahadith which is weak. Let's not even look at that. Those Sahih ahadith, open the books of Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, and many other books, you will find many, many ahadith that clearly categorize what is sin. However, just because popular culture, just because Muslims accept it, that does not mean that the Quran and the hadith will change. The Quran and hadith will remain as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in Al-Hajjat al-Wida that I leave behind with you two things. Kitab Allah wa sunnat rasul This will remain till Qiyamah. People will change. Civilizations will change. Mentality will change. Attitude will change. But the Quran and hadith will remain the same. And this is our yaqeen and our belief. And when it comes to looking down on other people, we have to be extremely careful. We have to be extremely careful. The good deeds that you do the ayat that you recite, the salah that you pray, the hadith we find in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when it comes to hasad, when it comes to envy, when it comes to hatred, when you look down on other people, it's like dry grass that is burning with the heat of fire. What happens? We have many, many fires in the Australian jungles. We have many, many fires in Canada and other parts of the world where there is a hot atmosphere and a hot environment. And when a small spark starts, an entire jungle sets on fire. A small spark starts, and an entire jungle is set on fire. In similar way, when we look down on other people, when we have enmity, hasad, when we have hatred for other people, in that same way, our a'mal are burnt away. You can pray salah all night and all day long. You can stand in prayer. But the moment you start looking down on other people, know, according to the Quran and the Hadith, that your, your deeds are being burnt away, like that jungle that sets a small spark and draw, drop, drop, burns out the khashab, burns out the dry grass and the dry hay. Brothers and sisters, this is an important topic to note. Because nowadays, nowadays, I think, I, lead, I want you to understand this term in English. It's all about me, myself and I. It's all about me. I pray salah, what do I get out of it? I give zakah, what do I get out of it? I perform hajj, what do I get out of it? I pray Quran, what do I get out of it? Allahu Akbar. It's all about me, myself, and I. And I am the best and everybody else is the worst. This is not what Islam teaches us. Islam teaches the other way around. That we should think to ourselves. Like Abu Bakr Siddiq would say, Ah, if only, and this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, the beloved friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was amongst those people who were promised Jannah, he would say, ah, if only I was a blade of grass that was just chopped up and forgotten about. Ah, if only I was a tree that was chopped up and used as firewood. If only I was nothing. We look at the life of Aisha radiallahu anha, who was one of the leading scholars of Islam who learned so much directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had so much high position, yet again their behavior would be, uh, I wish I was nothing. I wish I was not nothing. I wish I was not accountable in front of Allah. They would look at birds and they would say, how lofty and beautiful are the birds. That they come to the garden, they take the water and they fly away. And after a short period and they pass away, they will turn into nothing but dust. They will turn into nothing but dust. No accountability in front of Allah. However, brothers and sisters, you and I, those people that have come to the world and that have gone six foot down under in their graves, which tomorrow you and I will also go unto on Yawm al Qiyamah, we have to stand in front of Allah. We have to stand in front of Allah. And every word that has come out of your mouth, every action that you have done, every behavior that you have reacted for, you will be accountable in front of Allah. We have to think. We have to be realistic. Many of you, mashallah, 
studying here at the university, and when you go into lectures, when you go into ex when you go into seminars, when you're doing your work online, you have this thing nagging you at the back of your mind. What is that? That I'll have an assessment. I'll have an exam. Everybody's worried. Exam time. Everybody's in, in stress. Everybody's sending messages. Everybody's asking Sheikh, what dua do we need to read? What do we need to do? Ultimately, it's about your preparation. The more attention you give in class, the more attention you give at your studies, the more attention that you do your reading, when it comes to your exams, it will be a walk in the park. You won't see those twinkling stars and thinking, what do I do? This is exactly your life. This is exactly your life. How you behave, how you react, how you live your life, you live it good, you will die good. You die good, you will be resurrected good, and your accountability will be good. You live bad and poor, you will die poor and bad. You will be resurrected in a bad state, and your end situation will be a bad one. All of this brings us back to the earlier point. The shaitan is always sitting there. He is always trying to make our life difficult. And amongst those things are tricks. The you and I thing is not a trick. However, it is the greatest trick of shaitan. And shaitan is such, shaitan is such, that he will make you think that you are doing good. However, the ulama states that he will make you go through a hundred doors of good, a hundred doors of good to make you do that one bad. This is the trick of shaitan. He will do, make you do a hundred good things, but at the end, he will trap you into doing that one bad thing that you maybe have been thinking about all the way through from a long, long time. So never give in. They say the great, the foolish person. The foolish person is that person who trusts person who trusts themselves. They think that they're doing good and everybody else is doing bad. This is the foolish person. They are the one whose one foot is in this dunya and the other foot is in the fire of Jahannam. We have to be extremely careful. We will look at the books of a hadith and we will find Abu Hurairah radiallahu anha narrated by many of the muhaddithun. He says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yasturu abdun abda that a, a person, a servant. See, Allah Akbar. You know, when we look at the hadith and the ayat of the Quran and we understand the terminology chosen by Allah and his Rasul, every word is chosen for a specific reason. وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٍ يُوحَىٰ That he does not talk out of, his, out of his whim. However, every word that he says, everything that comes from Rasulullah is revelation. Now, of course, when it comes to the words of Allah, it is nothing but revelation. So the Prophet says, A servant does not hide the mistakes and the sins of another servant except, except, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hide his faults and hide his mistake on Yawm al Qiyamah. Now the question is, why didn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that when a human being hides the sins or a mistake of another human being? Because the reason why he chooses the word Abdul fil Abd is because only a servant of Allah who's conscious in their brain, who has taqwa and conscious of Allah knows that he has a responsibility, she has a responsibility of covering the mistakes of other people. And Allah Akbar, on that day, on that day, when there will be no other difficulty except for the difficulty of the believer, when we're standing on mahshar, when we go to account, when we stand in front of Allah, every person will be saying, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. When the Prophet ﷺ was mentioned in this hadith, he said that the situation will be that we'll be saying nafsi, 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 my soul, my soul, my soul. Aisha, and he said that everybody will be in a state that they'll be Uriyan and they'll be in a state of nakedness. Aisha radiallahu anha, who's always inquisitive, said, Ya Rasulullah, that so we'll be naked on the day of judgment. Won't the man look at the woman and the woman will look at the man? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, oh, Aisha, that day is a different situation altogether. Everybody will be saying nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. The sun will be on top of your head. You'll be drowning on your in your sweat. Everybody will be thinking what will be their state. Everybody will be in turmoil and in hardship. And on that day, a man has, has to stand in front of Allah. Jalla wa ala. Between Allah and the servant will be a scale. And Allah will bring every action of ours to account. And on that day, on that day, that servant of Allah, regardless of how practicing or non-practicing they were, Regardless of their state, when they consciously hid the mistakes of other people, on that day, when they will be desperate for Allah's mercy and Allah's help, Allah will hide away so many, many sins. 
And the servant of Allah will say, Ya Rab, I see deeds in my a'mal that I've never seen before. I did not even know that I had done them. And Allah will start to remind them of every minute good deed this person had done. And Allah will find a reason for that abd, for that servant to enter into the gardens of paradise. Why? Because this person is consciously worried about his hukuk al ibam and the rights of other people. Abu Huraira radiallahu <clears throat> anhu he mentions that everyone of my, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Every one of my followers will be forgiven on the day of judgment, and in this dunya and in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa taala will forgive the ummah except for that person who makes public the fault of other people. Allah will not forgive those people because this is a right of another person upon those people. This includes the disclosing of your own misbehavior, your own misbehavior. Allah subhanahu wa taala will capture us." even for exposing our own misbehavior. That is why fisk, as defined in the Quran, is that sin a person does openly. Somebody has a problem of drinking alcohol. That's his problem. But if he openly drinks the alcohol, doesn't bother what people think. And that actually makes a point. What's the problem? This is one of the greatest sins a person can do. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will severely punish them even furthermore because they have no consciousness of hiding their own sins. So what we learn in this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, that it's about not just other people, but even your own mistakes. Somebody has a problem. Let's say somebody has a problem where they do sins in the dark. Nobody else knows about it. Only this person and Allah knows about it. Nobody else knows about this sin. There is no need to go and expose your sins to other people. We dua to Allah. Ya Allah, I have this problem. Oh Allah, I have this bad habit. Oh Allah, I can't control myself. Or oh, whatever it may be. Ya Allah, assist me, guide me, show me the path. But there's no need to go and flaunt your mistakes in front of other people. And the Prophet ﷺ mentions that even, subhanAllah, mis- uh, we learn in the narrations, even the sins that are committed by an individual in the night, they should not be disclosed in the morning. It is completely private between the servant and Allah. That is why, brothers and sisters, in Islam, there is no celibacy. In Christianity, you want your sins forgiven, go and talk to the priest, you ask the priest for forgiveness, the priest will assist you. In Islam, direct within the abd and the ma'bud. Direct within the abd and the ma'bud, you directly communicate with Allah. If you want to know techniques of how to do that, assist support from the ulama. However, there is no need to go to anybody else. You can directly converse with Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. Finally, I leave you behind with two famous narrations. Time will not allow me to go into the detail. Imam Muslim and others have mentioned these narrations. That once a lady came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, execute upon me the, punish, the legal punishment of committing zina. And she was expecting Nevertheless, she was told to go away, she delivered the baby, and later on, a lady was then executed the punish, legal punishment of committing zina. We learn in the narration that an individual, a man who had a habit of drinking alcohol, he came and he um, sought punishment, and he was punished, and he was whipped because of his drinking of alcohol. The point which I'm coming to in the narration, we find that the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, Allahu Akbar, especially amongst the woman who was, who was stoned to death, the, the blood of that woman came and splattered onto some of their clothes. And they felt this yak, they felt this ah, they felt that, oh, this is a sinful person. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded them that her tawbah, her repentance in the eyes of Allah is such if all the entire people were to turn together and make tawbah, her tawbah is more maqbool in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So regardless of the sin, is about a person's devotion to Allah. This is what Allah wants to see. Each and every one of us sitting in this masjid today. And I address myself first and then to everybody else. How many things do we do wrong? So many things that we do personally, nobody else knows. And let's keep that personal. But turn to Allah in tawbah. And for those of us who do have a problem of exposing our sins in the public, and those of us who see it, let us not be judgmental. Let us not look down on the individual, but look down upon the sin, regardless of how kabira the sin may be. But yes, we have the responsibility of enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. If somebody is committing sins, if a whole community is committing sins openly, and they, they testify that this sin is acceptable openly, we do not accept this. We will not accept the sin. However, we will try to enjoin the good and forbid the evil, but remain open to the fact 
a sin is a sin, a haram is a haram. It is pointed by Allah. We as Muslims, we accept it. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that believers, our belief is upon Iman. And we believe all of the ahkam, all of the ayat that have come to us from Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though sometimes our brain may not understand. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand and let us live our lives in such a way that we can protect ourselves from shaitan. In such a way that shaitan does not trick us and makes us sick. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu